You're listening to Let's Talk Jobs, where we give you insights into jobs and careers. I'm Tim Chen, and today we're talking about the importance of digital accessibility. So what is digital accessibility? For websites, it means that all the content you see and the way that it was built is done in a way that makes it usable and accessible to all individuals, including those with disabilities. Now, most websites fall short of this because it goes far deeper than just color contrast and text legibility. Now, what if I told you your company could be held liable for this negligence and you could find yourself in the crosshairs of a major lawsuit? The goal of this video is to help you be more aware of how to deliver a better user experience to those with disabilities and to avoid potential legal action. Today, we're gonna to have a conversation with Zach Polweig. He's the Director of Client Success at Ability. In this video, he's going to talk to us about what is digital accessibility, how you are evaluated against WCAG compliance guidelines, and how to protect yourself from lawsuits. All right, let's get started. Hey guys, today we're talking about web accessibility and joining us is Zach Polweig, Director of Client Success at Ability Digital Accessibility Company. How are you doing, Zach? I'm really good, Tim. Thank you. Now, Zach, I'm just looking forward to this conversation because I believe that the topic of accessibility broadly is so important because it's probably one of the few topics where people truly don't know what they don't know. And the challenge or problem is that their company can actually be held liable for that negligence. And that can be anyone, could be in marketing, product support, or even human resources. Um, and being someone who's managed web, the danger is that most of us think that we're doing it, right? And by it, I mean being mindful of text legibility over colored backgrounds, let's say, but the spectrum of the handicapped and disabled is so broad. And that's just simply not enough to deliver a good web experience to them. And again, a smart or savvy lawyer can take advantage of this and essentially extort your company. So Zach, can you tell us a little bit about you know, what you're doing today, um, how long you've been doing it, and then maybe lead us into a conversation about what is accessibility compliance and why is it important to a user and a company? Definitely, I can sure, sure can do that. So I'm the Director of Client Success at Ability, as you mentioned, we're headquartered in the Pacific Northwest of the US uh, in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, in a sentence, what our company does is we work with governments, and businesses around the world to help them achieve their digital accessibility compliance goals. And depending on your industry and the regulations that govern uh, the business that you're in, there are slightly different goals. Um, I was hired number one at this firm actually 14 years ago uh, to the month. This is my 14th anniversary. Congratulations. And um, thank you, thank you. My business partner who's our CEO and I have completely bootstrapped and, and built this agency from scratch, which I'm very proud of um, because who we are today is very organic, you know, uh, and the growth growing as a bootstrap company is kind of wild. That's a story for another day. I'm not <laughs> sure if I would do that again. <laughs> not sure if I would do that again, but we're very happy to have landed where we are. And, uh, you know, digital accessibility is very similar to physical accessibility, at least in the spirit of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we know physical accessibility from the Americans with Disabilities Act from, I think, 1990 which really stipulated common sense things. You know, if, if your place of business has stairs, for example, to the main door, well, you need to provide an equivalent alternative means for say a wheelchair, so a ramp or a lift, or, you know, if you're at your favorite restaurant and the restroom signs have braille on them, these are all manifestations of the ADA Act. And so digital accessibility takes that principle and really applies it to, you know, things that are ubiquitous on our lives now, our smartphones, websites, uh, the software you use, uh, you know, the software you bank with um, or that you do your taxes with, you know, these things uh, are going to be difficult to use to an end user if an end user uh, has any kind of impairment or disability. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and very briefly to describe what those different types of impairments or disabilities are is uh, there are spectrums of vision loss. Uh, there are spectrums of hearing loss. Uh, there are all different kinds of cognitive impairment um, from being prone to seizures or needing, you know, longer to process information and everything in between. And then there's a spectrum of motor impairment. So think of paralysis or the inability to use your hands or fingers or limbs uh, to their full ability. Um, and then the one that's often forgotten about is temporary injury, like an injury mm. recovery. You know, uh, you're getting out of a radical surgery. And it's going to be months until you're whole again. Mm. Um, the, using websites or apps or software will be challenging unless those digital assets 
conform or uh, adhere to a very specific set of guidelines. And we're going to talk about this today quite a bit. The, there's an acronym, WCAG, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And this is actually one of the few things that is a universal. Every human on earth agrees, which is really crazy when you think about how divided we are nowadays. Every human on earth, every government on earth, every regulatory body on earth understands and agrees that if we want our assets to be accessible to those with impairment or disability, we need to make sure our assets conform to these WCAG guidelines. So companies mm. like mine often play the role of third party arbiter where we'll be hired to audit those assets, identify those weaknesses and those, we call them violations against the WCAG, and then you know work with the developers of record or the agency of record to go through rigorous auditing and then remediation to confirm the issues have been fixed. Hmm. Um, and so just to put a bow on that thought, once you confirm that your asset adheres to these guidelines, and there's no secrecy to them, they're publicly available, they're very well written, they're written by people in tech, so they're not written by attorneys or like <laughs> congressmen or congresswomen who usually are attorneys with lofty language, you know, it's like Shakespearean, takes 3,000 pages <laughs> to say the sun is rising. These are very common sense, easy to understand and attain guidelines that we help people make heads or tails of. Yeah, that's that's a really really good overview, and I, I you're, you're totally right, and I appreciate your statement about how it is totally globally acceptable, right? Because it's a universal guideline to adhere to, and in a world where we're trying to make websites scalable for all languages and, and regions, like one one fix here can fix it all, which is really good to know. Can you might maybe break it down a little deeper? So we talk about the WCAG guidelines. I think 2.0 is now now right. Um, can you help us understand maybe maybe the the key founding that the, the pillars or principles of which a website could be um, not necessarily audited but you validated based upon? Absolutely, yeah. And you nailed on a really important um, principle there in that this set of guidelines is a living document. It gets updated throughout time as technology evolves. So we're in a world right now where uh, you're either looking at draft version 2.0 or 2.1. They're very similar. There's mm -hmm. some differences, but that's really what everybody is aiming for right now. There's a new draft 2.2 that um, has been delayed because of COVID, but will be uh, published sometime in this calendar year, 2023. Um, so the principles, the principles are to ensure that content and the structure of assets. So let's use a simple website as an example. You know, content are things that change regularly, pictures, text, video, um, documents available for download, right? And then structure is how the, how the website is built, um, you know, how the blueprints are laid out, how it is coded, you know, how the menus are built and so mm -hmm. forth. These parts, these mechanics of say websites need to be uh, retrofitted in a manner so that as an end user, I can understand the content i can understand the context that is being presented to me okay and then i can take action in a meaningful way now mm -hmm. you can imagine as a thought experiment if i'm completely blind it will be very difficult for me to understand the context of something unless it is made obvious to me through something that we call alt text not to get into mm -hmm. too much how sausage is made uh, but it's about making sure that those things are consumable understandable and actionable uh, and adhering to the WCAG guidelines gets you to that finish line. Do you mind kind of sharing some examples of maybe the most common violations per each of those principles you called out, right? Um, just so that using like, like a tangible, you know, like learning from you. Yeah, that's a really good question. And we could spend hours here. So I'll keep you, I'll keep you, uh, all you listeners to just the hits <laughs> for today. Um, the the most common low hanging fruit is alt text. So, uh, you know, websites and software have tons of image files, you know, as part of the design. So lots of images, beautiful images, right? Um, well, if I'm blind, I have no idea what the contents of that image are. And mm -hmm. so as a blind person relies on an alt text description, which is just baked into the HTML, it's hidden to the to the eyeball. But it provides basically a little description to a screen reading software. Let's say if I have a, an image of you know, an NBA game taking place. Uh, the alt text description may say, you know, the Portland Trailblazers are playing the Oklahoma City Thunder and this image is of tip off. Mm -hmm. And so my screen reader will read that aloud to me and I'll say, aha, I can imagine in my mind what that would be. So that's alt, alt text. Um, then the 
the most important principle, and this gets a little bit more technical because it requires code remediation, but the most important principle of everything, like this takes care of probably three quarters of the guidelines, is everything that is a thing needs to be labeled as such within the superficial markup language of the site, the HTML, uh, so that a screen reader will know what to do with it. So anything that is a thing, which is a kind of funny saying, but buttons, menus, uh, modals, iframes, uh, YouTube embeds, uh, lists, headers, you know, anything that is a thing um, needs to be labeled as such so that when a screen reading or assistive software device uh, finds itself landing on that content, it goes, aha, this is a header. This is very important. I must read this aloud to the blind or impaired person or aha, this is a button and the button says buy now and clicking the buy now button takes me to the checkout page. You know, these are things that we take advantage of if we have full vision because we are, you know, our brain is processing this at like trillions yeah. of iterations a second. Uh, but if you don't have the use of your eyes, say, or even your limbs, you know, that becomes very difficult. So that's why accessibility is important. Can you give us some examples of maybe tools that the, um, that the, whether it's a visual impaired or orally impaired, whatever that spectrum is, like the common tools or ways that they navigate a website? So you, you mentioned screen reader earlier, like is there, is there a specific software mm -hmm. people use or is there physical devices? That's also a great question. We can tell Tim's done his, his research for this conversation. <laughs> I do my so, best. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the short answer is yes, there's a very specific set of tools that one would use if they have any kind of impairment. So first, and most obvious is a screen reader. So there are really two primary screen readers. There are others, but for all intents and purposes, the primary two screen readers that are used by the public uh, is a software called JAWS, which is a paid license to use, and then a software called NVDA, NVDA, which is a free software license to use. Mm -hmm. And these are classic screen reader software. So if I'm blind or uh, even uh, have physical impairment like a paralysis, I'm going to rely on this software that I have installed mm -hmm. on my computer to act as my eyes or to act as my fingers on the mouse. And uh, the purpose of these software is they will move me through a website, take me through uh, where I want to go and you know, get me to my end destination. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have to remember that we're in an increasingly mobile world. You know, many people are never going to visit a website on a laptop or desktop. They're only going to be using, say, their iPhone or Android. And so those two operating systems have their own built-in screen reading mm. software. So these, I, I wouldn't necessarily license the software and install it on my phone. They have built-in software. So uh, VoiceOver is the software for Apple devices and Voice Assistant is uh, for Android mm -hmm. devices. And those are just in there ready to go when mm -hmm. you turn on your phone. Yeah, and then finally, beyond that, um, you know, we get to like edge use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, if I have a certain type of paralysis, I'm uh, where maybe I have partial movement of my hands, but my, my fingers aren't working correctly. Um, I'm not going to use a trackpad or mouse. Perhaps I'm using like a joystick, almost like an old, you know, a gaming system joystick that's, you know, specific for that kind of impairment. But that really covers probably 90 plus cool. percent of the people what I just described. Yeah, thank you for that. Can, can you give us some examples, like publicly inf uh, available information around maybe companies that um, maybe weren't compliant and and maybe whether it's in the process of litigation or they're caught in a major remediation act to retrofit and um, because again, it hits everyone, um, small and large companies. And maybe just kind of just talk about that and, and maybe even shift from your personal experience, like maybe individuals that you've known who are impaired and now they've engaged with the website and maybe that experiencing the other end of it where it's now totally user friendly for them. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about both? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's start with um, your first question. So. I think it's important to just spend a minute on the legality of this topic specific yeah. to the US. So this is very interesting. It goes back to your high school civics classes and this is where the rubber actually hits the road is we do not live in a democracy. Uh, democracy is mob, mob rule, it's 50 plus one. We live in a republic and this is where the difference actually matters mm. is we have these three branches of government that have separation of powers, you know, blah, 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 all the things that we heard about in high school civics classes. Uh, but what that means in real terms, in real application, is the judicial branch of our government has to move in real time. People are getting sued. People are adjudicating things in real time today. Then we have the legislative branch, which, you know, just 
by definition, is always behind the times. They have to write laws and then amend laws and then all the political BS that everybody hates, has, you got to go through all that. And that takes time. And mm -hmm. so the laws that get written typically get written too late or, or late, right? And so the judicial branch has to move in real time. And so what, what we're seeing in the U.S. is the precedent has been set. This is the policy. While Congress has not written and passed a law that says you must adhere to WCAG if you have a business in America, full stop. In other countries, that is the case. Like in Canadian provinces, they have much stronger laws on the books. But we have the judicial branch, which uh, has you know, been tried thousands of times with thousands of cases. And what the, the judicial branch of government at every level has decided is, you know, the Americans with Disabilities Act was written really not for a digital world, mm -hmm. but we can apply the spirit of that to the digital world. And the mm -hmm. WCAG guidelines are the universal standard. Therefore, and here's the, here's the punchline is, if you're operating a business in the United States and someone calls you out for noncompliance, and if it's true, and it's typically true, um, then you lose, even though there's not a law in hmm. Congress, right? Because it's precedent has been set. And then, you know, the next time someone gets sued, they, they reference precedent behind that. Um, so that's very important. That is the playing yeah. field is if, if you are not doing something about compliance and, and someone catches you in a, in a pickle, um, it, it's very hard to, to win that case. Um, now to your, to your other question about, um, you know, maybe a personal anecdote, uh, a, a great childhood friend of mine from preschool, who I'm still very close friends with mm -hmm. today, uh, was in a really tragic accident in high school. He was an all state athlete. Three sport, three season, all state athlete. He was absolutely going to a Division One college uh, to do track and field, and he was in a snow skiing accident and, and broke his neck in, mm. in the senior year of high school. And uh, that's a cool success story for another day. But the Cliff Notes version is, uh, you know, he's he he refused to be a victim and he went to college and he got married and has family and has a wonderful career. Uh, but we joke all the time how inconvenient it is to be in a wheelchair and to have partial paralysis. And he talks all the time about how websites suck. I mean, that's just his, his <laughs> yeah. opinion from, from his perspective. You know, it's very difficult to live and navigate through websites. Imagine just trying to do online banking every day. If your online banking software is not accessible compliant, I mean, that will ruin your day, you know? Um, so that's where just personally, when I realized that this is hmm. very important, like very important. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I've, I've been preaching for a long time. So I'll yeah, no, I know. <laughs> I love that. I think it's it's important to remember, and to your point, there's humans behind these screens, right? And if you're a company, and most companies believe and strive to be customer centric, it's not just about the content you put out there, it's how you put it. And this is why it's so important. And again, your your point about the 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 litigation aspect of it, because it's 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 referential almost like it, that means as the guidelines get updated, you maybe you might have been compliant like three years ago. That may not be the case now, right? So again, because living and or uh, breathing or yeah. is an organic document, like your web posture has to reflect that, right? And that's why this is so so important. You're never truly safe if if someone's got their eye on you, right? Um, so I'm kind of bringing it back to something a little more practical than Zach. So there are a lot of free web tools out there, um, and we can I'll put a link to a few of them. Maybe even call some of that on this call since you're more familiar with that. Um, my experience with those is even if you register for them, the audit is pretty good in terms of giving you a list of things to work on, but it's certainly not comprehensive. And that's why working with someone like you is so important, right? Can you kind of maybe help us walk you through the types of free tools people can use today just to do um, evaluation because this is highly actionable, but then help us understand what a true audit looks like to you using tools and human and what that um, remediation looks like? Yeah, that's a great question. This is probably the most important question of today's interview. Um, in my industry, there are two ways to identify accessibility problems within a website. One is through automated tools like scanning software, and one is through a more intimate human-led review, human auditing, use case testing, so forth and so on. Most people start with uh, automated tools because they're easy. You know, you load in your website URL, you click a button, and it gives you a report. Um, like most things in life, there are there are trade-offs. And so we'll talk about those trade-offs in a second. Uh, but if you're just getting into accessibility compliance and you're like, wow, this is something I should care about, um, getting started with a scanning tool is a perfectly fine starting point. Um, there are a number of softwares, both free and paid, okay, um, 
my personal opinion is better quality when you pay, uh, but there are some free tools that you could start with. Um, there, Google provides uh, an accessibility tool. I believe it's called Lighthouse. It's part of a greater package, but it'll run a scan on your website and start to give you some insights on what needs to be done. Um, color contrast is something that can be found through an algorithmic mathematical means. So color contrast scanning tools are very accurate. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one we love by uh, WebAIM. It's, color, it's called a color contrast analyzer. It is very simple to use. You plug in the hex code of two colors and it gives you a mathematical output of here is the ratio. And then it even gives you more information of whether or not it passes WCAG hmm. 2.0 or 2.1 so forth. Um, there are a couple tools that I'm, I'm actually going to recommend that we avoid um, that are that are free. Um, or I know one is free, one may be paid, but there's a tool called Wave. That's a free scanning tool. Um, there's another one called um, Power Mapper. And I'm only going to speak from personal experience. Uh, um, part of our job is to work with attorneys uh, as they're going through accessibility audits with their clients. Mm. And we always talk about scanning software. And from what we have seen, and we've been doing this a long time, is we really need to be careful about the wave and power mapper scanning tools. Um, they often err on the side of false positives. So you run a scan with one of those reports and you're like, oh my goodness, I have 15,000 issues on my website. How is that possible? <laughs> and it's quite likely that most all of those are false positives. Um, and that this is to say nothing bad about software. It's just that there's limitations to what software can find. Um, so for those of you using Wave, it's probably the most popular tool. Um, so continue to use Wave if that's what you want to do, but just keep a grain of salt uh, uh, with this, knowing that it may be more inaccurate than you than you think. Mm -hmm. And why this is not an indictment on any scanning software is the trade-off that I mentioned a couple minutes ago. The only way to identify all compliance issues that exist on a site is through human testing. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe in a decade when AI continues to evolve, it's a different conversation. But right now, only human intervention can determine many of these WCAG uh, guidelines. And mm -hmm. that's because they're just so nuanced and so complex. So what my company primarily does is, is we, we kind of call it doing it the right way the first time, human-led review, auditing, and testing. And it's a, it's a multidiscipline approach where we're doing screen reader testing using the software that I mentioned earlier. We're doing mobile reflow or mobile responsive testing. Um, we're doing keyboard navigation testing. So that's kind of like turn off your screen reader, unplug your mouse, and you're only testing using keystrokes on your keyboard. That's a very challenging one to, to pass because mm -hmm. you have to have everything dialed in. Uh, we do technical auditing, which is kind of a multi-dozen point inspection of all unique page templates. And then we do random sampling. Um, and for good measure, then at the end, we run a website uh, through our own proprietary scanning software, you know, acknowledging that there are limitations to scanning software. Uh, but that's really the only way to do this the right way. And so for those of you out here who may be considering this as a need within your company, I, this is what I tell people all the time. If you want to reduce your risk to as close to zero as possible, if you want to fully comply with those guidelines, if you want to make sure you don't get sued or get sued again, you really need to include human interventive testing and uh, auditing to make sure everything is found. So how does a, com um, a company who's gone through, let's say they remediated their website, how can they supply something like a document or certification or verification that they taking the efforts to be compliant in a way where it maybe removes the burden of like, like litigation or um, mm. a, a fault, right? Uh, there are two very specific answers to that question. The first is that you could have a VPAT document authored uh, for your asset in question, your app, your software, your website. Okay, so a VPAT is voluntary product uh, accessibility template, VPAT, mm. okay. Um, and a VPAT is a universal templated document. Every VPAT that is ever authored looks exactly the same. And a VPAT is a public declaration of the accessibility compliance or lack thereof within your asset. It's usually about 10 pages long. And the real meat of the document is a table. And every row in the table represents one of the WCAG requirements. And then in the columns, uh, you declare publicly whether or not that specific guideline is applicable to your website or app, um, whether or not it conforms, and if not, 
explaining why. So that's the first document that people will expect to see to verify proof of conformance. The second document is uh, something that a company like ours would provide, and we're not, certainly not the only company that does this in the US, mm -hmm. and it's called uh, like verification or certification. So mm -hmm. that's where we, as a third party, are independently verifying on the day of our final review, this, this asset either meets or exceeds the standards of the WCAG. And if there are limitations, you know, maybe it couldn't, you couldn't bring it to full compliance for X, Y, or Z reason. We publicly declare, here are the limitations, here's why the limitation exists, and here's our plan on how to address that moving forward. And then hmm. beyond that, I think the next most important thing is that you really need to, you really need to consider an ongoing effort, whether that's automated scans at a cadence, or whether it's having a company like ours audit uh, in a human-led way multiple times a year, because your assets change. You know, it's like that's how websites work is they evolve over time. So you need to make sure you have a commitment to maintaining compliance over time. And if you do these things, like these are kind of best practices mm -hmm. that I'm giving right now. If you do these things, we're reducing your risk of being sued or getting a demand letter by orders of magnitude. Um, and it is always the case that however much time or money that you pay to go into this compliance journey uh, will be a fraction of the cost of doing nothing and potentially getting sued or getting a demand letter. Yeah, you're, you're, it's totally true. You know, I think you think a, a lawyer who is trying to like be a, almost like a predatory nature, right? Trying to target companies of which to extort money using this type of lawsuit, even having that certification in itself is like, it's kind of not worth the time. Like just, just even having that proof is almost enough to probably deter most of the cases, right? Because again, they're trying to hit by, by mass, right? I think you hear a lot of situations where they're sending out 20, 50 of these notifications at once to companies and then see which ones bite, right? So again, you're trying to minimize your risk and exposure to doing this. How often do you think a company should do an audit is it like a six months, a year, two years? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Good question. So the answer will be variable based on you know something that's out of my control, which is uh, how fluid is this website? You know, if it's a if it's a like a marketing brochure style website that's not going to change much for four mm. or five years, you know, it's, I'll have a much different answer than if you have an e-commerce website or even just a, mm. a more complex you know brand site that's changing and evolving and new features and micro engagements yeah. and calls to action and sales funnels and all that kind of stuff. So if you have a fairly static website that doesn't change over time, my personal recommendation is you should go all in on this one time, dial everything in, and then, you know, moving forward, do very small types of maintenance because the only things that may change are like a blog post. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a very short checklist of what you could do to maintain a clean blog for websites that are more fluid and, complex and nuanced, uh, at a minimum, we need to be doing something substantial once a year. Mm -hmm. um, that's really my, my sound advice is once a year, you need to be doing something. We offer a service that's actually a twice a year service where twice a year we come to the table, go through a re-auditing effort and a re-verification of compliance. Um, and I would say twice a year is a good sweet spot for the typical business where this website is changing a lot. Um, We've had rare cases where clients ask for quarterly uh, mm. deliverables of conformance. That gets quite busy for all parties. Like you're, <laughs> you're basically never ending. You're always doing remediation and that can be difficult unless you have like a big compliance team. Yeah. So once a year as a minimum, twice a year cool. is even better. Awesome. So I'm going to shift gears here a little bit um, and just kind of talk about just working in this industry and field altogether, right? Because I think I'm going to use myself as an example. Let's say... Um, I find myself unemployed and I, I want to maybe consider transitioning job into this field because you've totally sold me on why it's so important, right? Um, <laughs> now, I might just off the bat say, you know what? I do not have a background in WCJ compliance, nor do I know all the details that go into that. I feel like not knowing that puts me at a disadvantage and that might prevent me from applying altogether. But I'm hoping the truth is that that's definitely important, but there's other things that you look for in an individual, whether it's skills or aptitude or even personality or drive or whatever, whatever the aspect is that's important. And I'm also assuming that the entry points, whether it's an entry position, or whatever, it's could be maybe just it's diverse, right? So um, can you help us understand maybe 
the skills um, or knowledge that you believe is required to enter into this field and maybe even share a little bit about your journey. Like, did you, like, how did you get started? Was it linear or did you kind of go like this yeah. in your career and land here? Like, yeah. Awesome questions. So let's first talk about the industry in general. Um, uh, the good news is uh, if you're considering the, uh, this career path, digital accessibility compliance, first of all, uh, this industry is growing exponentially year over year, and it's been doing that for about five years. It's a very exciting industry to be in in the U.S. because we are just hitting public awareness of digital accessibility as a need. So there's so much opportunity and so few vendors right now. We really have a supply and demand problem. A lot more demand for the work than there is supply of vendors. That's first mm -hmm. of all. Um, secondly, the WCAG is not rocket science. Um, anyone can learn these principles and become an expert in the field. There are two, I'll just give a quick plug. I'm not paid for these endorsements, but I'll plug them anyways. Uh, we have two primary trade organizations, the IAAP and the W3C. So the IAAP is the International Association of Accessibility Professionals. The W3C are the folks who actually author and maintain the WCAG guidelines. Both of them have memberships where you can join as an individual, very low cost, and then take really awesome continuing education courses. Uh, they provide independent certifications like hmm. career certificates. So for a very small amount of money resources, plus some of your time, you can really become an expert quickly in this field. So I recommend that. Mm -hmm. um, then for the industry in general, there are, uh, you know, in a company like ours, I think there's like four primary job roles mm -hmm. and these are universal. So one of them, is, of course, is sales. Uh, this type of business, or excuse me, this type of industry is B2B sales. Uh, this is like high competency sales. Um, we're not just you know, selling somebody, convincing them and move on. We're talking about complex compliance, B2B, a lot of legal liability in terms of the services that are being provided. So if you are a good relationship builder, if you can build bridges and trust and rapport and then you know, make the ask, that's the mm -hmm. sales part. Uh, this is a really exciting career. Secondly is project management. So you know, the, the PM career path fits in our industry because uh, we have all kinds of clients and accounts that need to be managed and, and PMs, whether junior, primary, senior, executive PM, you have a place in this industry. Um, thirdly, and most importantly, are the workhorses, the auditors. Um, so to be an auditor, you need to be incredibly detailed. You need to be a detail-oriented, analytically thinking person because your job is to be looking at websites and code all day long. And for some people, that is like a dream, you know, and others, it's a nightmare. So that's very important. Um, you do not need to be a web developer by trade to be a good auditor. Although I will say, if you have a background in code, it does give you a head start and this will come more naturally to you. Mm -hmm. But we have staff auditors who were web, are web developers and also staff auditors who were not web developers. They're all equally competent, but that's something to mm -hmm. consider. And then the fourth and final category is like technical support, customer support. Um, this is also very classic. It applies to any industry, uh, but companies like ours are always looking for technical or customer support people, you know, providing empathetic, highly communicative support. It's mm. a pretty standard recipe. So those are career paths. Um, then our journey is very interesting. The, the very mm -hmm. abbreviated version of our journey is that we were not an accessibility consultant on day one. We were mm. a web dev firm in the Pacific Northwest. We designed and built websites. We, I mean, we were a dime a dozen, you know, nothing special about what we did. Mm -hmm. In 2000 and 2010, we won a government contract to build a website here for a local municipality. One of the requirements, it was like the last, you know, afterthought bullet point on the RFP was like, must comply with accessibility. We thought, how hard could that be? <laughs> and we, we won the bid and it turned out we won the job because we underbid dramatically because we had no idea what accessibility was. <laughs> and now, <laughs> Now we're contractually obligated to deliver something we know nothing about. So we, we tried to hire a consultant. We looked across the whole US, this is 13 years ago. There were only like two accessibility vendors at that point. And you know, neither of them would even talk to us for like anything less than like a $20,000 retainer. You know, and that mm -hmm. was like just for the coffee. Um, and we realized, oh, this, like, this work is not rocket science. It's not $600 an hour hard, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what the industry was charging. But it was because mm -hmm. supply and demand. I mean. God bless them. There's only two companies. You charge whatever you want and enough people will be willing to, to pay the freight. So that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And to my business partner's credit, to our CEO's credit, you know, he, he said, 
you know, there's nothing special about what we do with web design and web development. I mean, there's 50 companies that do that just in our city alone that we're operating in, but nobody's doing accessibility compliance. And, and he made a bet that this would be the third evolution of web dev after SSL encryption and mobile responsiveness. He said, accessibility mm -hmm. compliance has got to be the next wave that hits the beaches. Mm -hmm. And to his credit, he was right. And so we got in at the right time uh, in 2014, 15, we really transitioned out of agency life completely and into accessibility consulting. Mm -hmm. And we, we were just very blessed that it was like the right time with the right offering. You know, from our agency world, we knew how to bring in business. We knew how to close business. We knew how to retain business with great customer service. We were just changing our discipline to a new thing. Yeah. Um, but we're really glad we made that leap because we're one of maybe just 10 vendors today that do this. So it's still a very small industry. Yeah. yeah. Zach, I just want to thank you for today. Like the, the information you gave was so helpful because again, I truly, truly to the core of me believe that accessibility is one of those things where people just do not know what they don't know. And it's, it's hard to say I'm coming out of this meeting having been the same as before, right? Like now I know. And so I thank you for just this really actionable insight. I really like your breakdown into the four types of careers one can expect if they were to step into accessibility. Um, thank you so much. Is there, um, how can people find you or your website? Oh, great question. So um, we are at onlineada.com, online A like Adam, B like David, A like Adam.com. You can find us there. Um, and then if I could give one more thought, because I know um, I know some of the people may be listening, may be thinking about uh, finding a career in, in our industry. And so something we hate doing is <laughs> going through the interview process, you know, reviewing 500 resumes. That is not fun for anyone on our team. Um, and I just want to put this out there. Uh, as advice I wish I had when I was like in my early 20s mm. coming up in my career is if you want something, go out and get it. Like so many people just go through the emotions, like I'll do my cover letter, I'll send in my resume, I'll see what happens. Now, if you want to work with us, reach out to us. Like find my CEO's email address, phone number, uh, find where he gets coffee, go grab him, talk to him, say, this is my name, this is the value I bring and I want to work with you. Like that really makes a difference because we want people who want to be with us, you know. Mm. Um, so it, I promise it is worth it. And I know that is kind of going out of comfort zone sometimes. It's like being vulnerable and putting yourself out there. But it's a first world problem. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, sorry, no, not for us. But who cares? So yeah. just put yourself out there and it will pay off in all aspects of life, especially in trying to find a job. Totally agree, man. As a matter of fact, embracing your vulnerability in a way that allows you to bring your true self out applies to everything. And I think for the less, those of us who can comfortably get there um, or work with someone to help you bring that out, um, I think that's a key to success. That's so a good call, Zach. Thank you, Tim. Cool. Thanks a lot. All right. Talk soon. Talk to you soon. Yeah, bye. -bye.